I like to think we're at the forefront of pushing forward what's possible on the product side with DeFi at DYDX. Um, but even for us, I, I think it's probably five to 10 years from now until DeFi starts really competing with CeFi head to head. All right, and welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. We have a great episode for you today. We were joined for an interview uh, by Antonio, the CEO and founder of DYDX, the Decentralized Perpetuals Contract Exchange. Uh, and with everything going down in the crypto markets with the collapse of FTX, this really kind of initiated a conversation around uh, you know, the shortcomings of CeFi and how DeFi is building systems that resolve these exact problems. Uh, but before we get into that great uh, interview today, we are joined by two other members of the BlockWorks research team, Matt and Westy, just to discuss the latest happenings of the market. Uh, it's been another crazy week. It feels like it's relentless, but we'll get right into it, uh, an episode of Cool Hot Seat, Cool Throne, just to kind of break down what's been happening. Uh, Sam, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Who you got in the hot seat this week? Yeah, for sure. Hot seat's pretty easy this week for me. I've got consensus. They developed MetaMask, and over the weekend, or maybe it was uh, towards the end of last week, over Thanksgiving, they quietly updated their privacy policy and stated that IP and wallet addresses would be collected if you use their default RPC in MetaMask on Ethereum. So they're kind of, you know, taking users' information, infringing on privacy, which is kind of in part the point of crypto. So uh, they're definitely in my hot seat this week. Yeah, man. You know what really scares me about that is even if they're not doing anything that you don't want them to with your data, it's scary that there could be a leak or a hack. You look at um, the leak and, or hack, whatever happened with Ledger, the crypto wallet, maybe two, three years ago, um, whatever, in recent history. And there ended up being a large amount of wallet information, addresses, emails leaked. And, you know, that's really sensitive information, especially when you could be uh, you could have a five dollar wrench attack at your door. So it really scares me that MetaMask is collecting that data. And I definitely will be switching my RPC from Infura. Is it enough to just switch your RPC within MetaMask or do you, would you recommend switching wallets completely i believe and i could be wrong on this but i believe that you have to add a different ethereum network due to the constraints of the way metamask was created and then add a new rpc manually um, but that's the most recent thing i heard on it and uh, that's what i did so i think that's probably the best move or like you said maybe just going to a an external wallet altogether like i don't know x DeFi wallet or, or something else yeah, as a as a Thorchain user, uh, that kind of exposed me to XDeFi. It definitely, like, I don't know. It just feels like we don't have uh, the 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 wallet that is like our our final uh, go to market, right? It just it feels like we're there's so many missing like elements in each wallet. Like, you know, Phantom on Solana uh, was a great wallet for like NFT users, and you know, XDeFi has got like the cross chain applications, uh, and then MetaMask is kind of like that OG that uh, UI UX that everyone came comfortable with, but it doesn't feel like we really have that final wallet that uh, is the one that is like ready for mass adoption yet. So uh, looking for more builders to kind of push in that direction. And uh, I'm definitely open to, to changing wallets here. Westy, who you got in your hot seat? Yeah, given that it was Thanksgiving this past week, my hot seat is definitely anyone in crypto that was uh, asked about FTX this Thanksgiving. I know I was pretty lucky. No one in my family asked me about it. I think they probably discussed earlier and was like, I think we should give them a pass this year. Um, but I can imagine there are a lot of tough conversations around crypto. Like, will it survive? What even is it? Um, I'm sure you probably got a lot of tough questions and probably wasn't as exciting as last Thanksgiving where things were pretty, pretty bullish at the time. And so, yeah, anyone in crypto at a Thanksgiving dinner was definitely in my hot seat this week. Yeah, strong agree there. I know my girlfriend's dad asked me what was going on with FTX, and that was not a fun thing to answer. And I got the uh, inevitable question of, is your job safe? So <laughs> we shall see. I had a whole a whole list of controversial topics lined up, like bringing up politics, bringing up gun rights, bringing up all this different stuff that would cause issues so, to get the topic away from crypto. But I was lucky like USD and no one even brought it up. So I didn't need to deploy the uh, strategies. I, I love it. Coming in, never go anywhere unprepared, Matt. That's the way to do it. I actually got blindsided by my girlfriend's grandmother. So props to her. Maybe she did some research trying to trying to start some conversation with me. I don't know, but I loved it. I was like, okay, way to way to still uh, be caring what's going on in the world. Uh, but to stick with Westy's theme here, uh, my hot seat is definitely turkeys, uh, and the lead turkey is no doubt Peter McCormick because he famously said, "I trust BlockFi more than smart contracts." 
uh, and BlockFi seems to be on the brink of insolvency, if not bankruptcy. And you know, we're recording this on November 28th at about 4 p.m. Uh, and as of yet, there's no official bankruptcy de uh, declaration, but it feels like we're inching closer and closer. Uh, so for the fact for Peter to say, you know, I trust a centralized entity more than smart contracts is in, you know, just uh, open source code. That's pretty mind boggling to me. Uh, and maybe it says something about Bitcoin maximalists. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I actually thought I did see something this morning about them filing for bankruptcy. Um, if I'm not wrong, and I totally could be, maybe I saw something that was like some, along the lines of they had a billion dollars in liabilities and only $200 million in assets to cover them. And I think that was Bitcoin Telegraph on Twitter. I think I actually saw that. Um, so I'm not exactly sure if they officially filed or not yet, but regardless, it does not look good for <laughs> for BlockFi. And I feel like we kind of all saw that coming over the last three to four weeks. So Hopefully they're able to figure it out. Doesn't look good, but hopefully users get some of their funds back is uh, the main takeaway there, I feel like. Yeah, it just sucks because BlockFi wasn't like an FTX in that, I mean, it was in the, their terms of service that they will essentially take your assets and try and get yield on them. It wasn't like an FTX where they were committing any fraud. They just deployed their assets into some loans that were riskier than others, as well as another big on the GBTC trade as well. And so they just had deployed the funds in not the, the highest value way possible, and they kind of got screwed by the, the rest of the market, um, which sucks for them because, like I said, they weren't any, they weren't a fraudulent actor, they weren't lying, uh, they were just caught up in what was a lot of froth in the market and needing to provide a, a lot of yield because they were competing with a lot of the high APY yield farms and DeFi, um, and so yeah, just... Like they're definitely not on the same level as a lot of the the FTXs or the Voyagers. Yeah, strong agree there. But on the bright side, I saw something that said they already liquidated all their crypto holdings to like try and raise cash like a month ago. So at least it'll have no market impact, at least hopefully. But nowadays, don't believe what you read on Twitter, I suppose. Uh, Matt, who you got in the hot seat? My hot seat is wrapped ETH futters uh, over the long weekend since Thanksgiving till about today. There was a lot of rhetoric on crypto Twitter about, you know, wrapped ETH. There was some troll posts that it was like hacked, that they didn't have the money to back, you know, the amount of ETH. And for those that don't know, wrapped ETH is just a 40 some odd line smart contract that you can wrap ETH in. It gives you back wrapped ETH at any time. You can go reverse that transaction, put in wrapped ETH, um, and get ETH back. And the reason it's actually necessary and vital to the ecosystem is Ethereum's not an ERC-20 token. And when you're doing thing, things ERC-20 to ERC-20, ERC to ERC it's a lot more gas efficient and cheaper to be using two ERC-20s than to use Ethereum, which is not, and in the ERC-20 that is. So it makes you know the ecosystem cheaper for things like swapping on Uniswap and other things of that nature. And just seeing all that FUD was uh, pretty, pretty disgusting because it's, you know, one of the more well audited smart contracts. It's short. It's probably been looked at by pretty much everyone in the space. There's no central custodian. So, you know, taking a, thinking about it in a negative light or saying that there's a, a large possibility that it's hacked or that they don't have the funds to back it is kind of a clownery in my opinion. Yeah, strong agree there. I, I like even like I was thinking about it and I kind of like chuckled at it, but I think like even 95% of people on crypto Twitter, which is probably like 2% of people actually in crypto, like there's only like 5% of people who would understand that joke. So I was like this isn't going to end super well. Then I woke up this morning and I see articles on I think it was either Bloomberg or Business Insider saying like, "Oh, Rapt ETH is in trouble." And it's just like, "Gosh, why do we do this to ourselves?" But <laughs> kind of funny nonetheless. Yeah, to try to attempt to give that uh, Bloomberg article article some credit, uh, within the body of the the article, it mentioned that it was a joke. But of course, like one of the two bullets at the top of the the, the right below the headline uh, was the the you know the the risks around Rapt ETH or whatever, however they chose to word it. So. Uh, yeah, it is wild how like uh, the jokes between, you know, three or four people turn into uh, f headline news articles. I just think it's so funny how, like you said, like these TradFi uh, publications are just watching crypto Twitter in the same way we are. And these like um, sort of community journalists, like following them and getting the insights from them and then reporting it back to their audience. I think that's pretty cool in its own right. Like it does sound like they got it right, that it was a joke, which is good. Good to hear, because otherwise maybe they, they stop trusting a lot of the sources they were getting on crypto Twitter, which really is the best source of info. 
But yeah, it's cool that they're they're sort of looking in on us on crypto Twitter. Let's head over to Cool Throne, Westy. Who you got? Yeah, my Cool Throne. It's tough to have a Cool Throne right now, but it really is the the builders in DeFi. Like a lot of these DeFi protocols, like are completely unfazed by a lot of the FTX drama. Like Discords are super active, Telegrams are super active. The builders are staying with their roadmaps. Like they have complete conviction in the space, and I can see it. And it's really awesome to see after what have been some of the biggest blowups in crypto's history. Like people are still uh, chugging away on what they're building, and they're building great stuff. And so you love to see that, yeah, the industry is chucking along no matter what happens. Yeah, and Antonio even dives deep into uh, what DYDX specifically is doing uh, in the interview we have for you today. Um, but yeah, it is great to see, like, you know, bear, you know the, the common phase, bear markets for building is, is, you know, it always remains true whenever the, the depths of these cycles hit. Yeah, I guess I would add, I mean, I don't know how good these stats are. Like, you can go to Artemis or Goku stats and kind of check out, like, developer activity. And it's pretty much fallen off a cliff since the bull market, but those are also easy stats to, to fluff. So that would be my one rebuttal. But but yeah, I mean, nothing makes someone want to work harder on a project they're building if they see, you know, the number go down. Like, you'd think they'd be like, all right, well, no one else is going to fix this and make it better. So I guess I have to if I want to save my bags. Yeah, I even saw a thread this week um, from someone in the Solana community where they basically like put out a survey to a bunch of devs that they knew um within that community and it seems like they've hunkered down and are pretty like still pretty confident in solana and are staying there to build like a majority of the developers um which is really interesting to see i mean given all that's happened to the solana i mean they've been on our hot seat like three weeks in a row that's pretty bad for them but um yeah it's good to see that even they have super strong conviction are going to keep building and i really hope they do rise from the ashes because like we need better builders um, because it really uh, the rising tide lifts all boats i could take it over for uh cool throne next i got acx dumpers in the cool throne why because actually let me start with uh across is a l2 bridge between ethereum l2s um, and they just uh, launched their token via airdrop today uh, it's ACX, but I'm giving the cool throne to the dumpers because ACX pretty much is just a governance token. It doesn't really have any utility in the form of paying for transaction fees or getting MEV um, from validators back to uh, the token. So I think that that token will get dumped pretty hard, especially when considering that LPs can stake their LP tokens in order to earn ACX uh, rewards. So yeah, I think that one's a down only chart for a while until governance kind of like incorporates some kind of value accrual mechanism. Yeah, I was definitely someone that as soon as that airdrop was able to claim, I redeemed it and sold it on the market. And it looks like it's trading at, I think, five cents per token, which is super interesting because they just raised capital at 20 cents per token, which it's now trading at, what, 25% of that. And so I think this may be a trend going forward in which we see a lot of the, the private market valuations, especially ones that were super high, like this was a $200 million FTV for a token that has no value accrual, like you said. And so maybe we start seeing like a lot of these private raises that were super high like on the public markets that they, they reach really, really low valuations versus that private valuation. I also think something we're still working on is like token distribution methods. Um, like I, I like how you guys all hit on the fact that it's like a pretty useless token. Uh, but one thing to consider is like how the distribution ends up flowing, right? And we see like these Gen 1 style airdrops to like early users. Like we're starting to, there's a lot of conversation around the fact that these just aren't effective ways to like uh, get users to, in your protocol. Uh, Tarun actually recently reha rehashed one of, an old Dune dashboard uh, that like goes to show that the uni airdrop receivers like don't uh, overwhelmingly overwhelmingly use the protocol to trade assets like they're not overwhelmingly involved in the LP process um, it was just like an easy way to just distribute tokens and decentralize the protocol but it didn't necessarily gain a ton of users um, you know Matt you and I were actually talking about this earlier so I'd love to hear your counterpoint to this because it's a really uh, well said point yeah so like the dune dashboard and the analyses of it do make a great point as to you know 
the amount of cap, the amount of, of money that was given to these uni token airdrop people was not made up within their fees or, you know, their activity in the network. But I think one thing that it might have done, and there's no real way to prove this, but I think that it might have created a big brand moat for Uniswap. I think that the average person, when they think crypto, when they anyone who knows about DeFi can even like tell you what decentralized finance is, has probably heard the word Uniswap and they may not have heard of Matcha, One Inch, and Aggregator or any of the other decentralized exchanges. And I think that largely that's a result of the airdrop they weren't the first amm they're not the last they're not the most capital efficient um, they're not the best for swapping stable coins so you know at the end of the day it's like what the why why do people go to uniswap to trade why do some people not even check aggregators to, for better prices and maybe a big portion of that was the fact that they got so much buzz surrounding that token airdrop so many people were happy with them and just liked the brand liked the name so i do think that they might have gained a huge portion of value from that aspect of the airdrop although there is no way to prove that yeah it definitely it feels like there's some intangibles there uh, but for my hot, or excuse me, for my cool throne, uh, I kind of take it uh, what Westy said and uh, give a specific example. So, uh, some DeFi builders I think are killing it right now uh, is the Thorchain community. Uh, they recently launched their uh, Sabers Vaults program, which is effectively like a you know we see a lot about like CFI earn programs, like deposit asset and earn in kind yield in that said asset. Uh, but this one's done totally decentralized, and that's why I think it's exciting. Uh, so basically, uh, how this works is, uh, let's see, earlier in 2022, Thorchain launched their synthetic assets, um, which effectively, like, uh, a synthetic asset is backed 50% by that asset and 50% by the protocol's native token, Rune. Um, and so you are like taking, you're not taking price exposure to uh, Rune, like a synthet synthetic asset is backed one to one and redeemable for uh, the deposit, right? So if I have one synthetic Bitcoin, then it's redeemable for one native Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network. Uh, and so it's cool to see that they launched this primitive uh, maybe six to eight months ago. Uh, and now they're actually like, you know, DeFi Legos, they're building on this primitive to launch their Savers vaults. Um, and basically how this works is you mint a synth and now you have the ability to stake that synth in a vault and earn native yield on it. Uh, and so this is pretty exciting, you know, with a lot of these CFI uh, earn programs, everything was like obfuscated in a black box and you didn't know how they were generating this yield. Uh, but with Thorchain, it's very transparent, right? Um, you're earning trading fees and block rewards, a, a smaller portion of trading fees and block rewards uh, that is earned by LPs. So you're effectively taking like an, an LP position and then only taking the single sided exposure from that. Uh, and so you have less risk and therefore less reward. And right now uh, there's about 500 total users that are using the platform uh, for the savings vaults uh, and about $2 million deposited. Uh, and currently Bitcoin's uh, APR is around 4%. So uh, pretty interesting development there. I don't know, how, I think it's gonna be like less attractive for some of these proof of stake coins, right? Like if I can stake Atom in like with directly in the network, or I can stake ETH directly in its own network, uh, I'll probably end up earning a higher yield than you would like using a savings vault uh, on Thorchain. But ultimately like those would balance out, I think. And based on the trading fees, uh, I, f I feel like there'd be like some equilibrium that'll end up balancing out, but super excited to like see uh, a decentralized earn program kind of come through and, and it's like, you know, real, re real yield based on block rewards and trading fees. Fully agreed. It's super nice to see a decentralized exchange where you can actually swap between native Bitcoin and Ethereum or anything like that. And to your second point about finding better yields on staking tokens elsewhere, thank God for liquid staking derivatives, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that that solves a lot of the issues on that front when you're able to go stake your asset, get a liquid staking derivative like a staked ETH or a, maybe a Lido staked Cosmos, which might, or Lido staked Atom, which is supposed to potentially go up for governance uh, vote soon. So I do think that, you know, that's a problem that we'll see fade away. Yeah, Thorchain's really cool. I really like what they're building. I guess the one thing I would caution people listening would be, you know, they've experienced a couple different hacks over the course of their history. So jumping into a new product that hasn't been battle tested, I'd be a little bit wary. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're working on one of the hardest problems in crypto, just like native asset cross chain swaps. Like that's super difficult. And there's a reason most bridges don't try and go that route because of how difficult it actually is. So I think on that specific niche in crypto, Thorchain really has kind of developed a somewhat of a moat and it's going to be tough to replicate the same success that they've had. Yeah. On average, they do roughly 11% of daily bridge volume, which isn't an overwhelming amount. 
uh, but multi-chain's the leader there, and they're only around like 18 to 20 percent. Uh, so it's actually a pretty competitive uh, market in the bridge landscape, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and one more fact is, uh, during the week of the FTX collapse, so let's say November 6th through 12th, um, Thorchain's use actually jumped to 16%. Uh, so pretty significant jump there. Uh, and I feel like that speaks a lot about the user's confidence in Thorchain to execute transactions in a time of need, as well as the assets that they have selected uh, to list. Because uh, you know, listing an, a new asset on the network is not like a, a very easy thing to solve. You have to the validators have to run nodes on these other chains. Um, so they've done a great job curating uh, like which assets are listed. Uh, so it's cool to see. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump. Or actually, Matt, like, give us your. You have one of the better cool thrones. You almost did it again, Dan. Dude, I know. I get excited. I have a one little comment about your cool throne, actually, about Thorchain, which is just maybe it helped that the FTX hacker moved all their funds out through Thorchain. I think I don't know if that's true, but I think that might be true. So uh, that might have helped with their volume dominance throughout that whole ordeal, if that's correct. My cool throne today is Yano, BlockWorks' very own Jason Yanowitz. He's our commander-in-chief, co-commander-in-chief. He's one of uh, the founders of our company, along with Mike. And about five months ago, five and a half months ago, he wrote this crazy viral thread about the three stages of a bear market, where basically the first stage, the TLDR, everyone should go read it, though. It's really good, and it's long. But the first, the first part is the it's fine stage. Everything's going down, but people are still bullish. They're still happy. They're still excited. Stage two, four sellers, um, people who are reliant on a token start to collapse. Their companies don't you know, make it. They have to sell their tokens. Funds fail, things of that nature. Stage three, he says, pain turns to boredom, I believe, which is like, you know, people are leaving. There's nothing cool going on. There's no narratives. There's no pumps. There's no news. And that was about five and a half months ago. And we've total. and he says at the time of writing that, you know, we're entering phase two. So this is in June of 2022. He says, we're entering phase two, we're entering max pain. And we saw pretty much the last five months play out exactly like he says in the tweet thread. Companies that were too reliant on a token, call it Celsius, FTX, you know, name, name a company. They went down. They they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't hang, and they had to dump all their tokens for sellers. Max pain in the markets, blood everywhere. People leave. People you know upset. Bears are just loud. You know, there's bearish sentiment everywhere. The bulls aren't even really making a big splash on crypto Twitter anymore. And it played out exactly like he said. And I think it's this is in my opinion, but I think that it looks like we're entering phase three exactly like he says to right now, where it's just like. Things are slowing down. There's not a lot of news, not a lot of narratives to catch, not really a lot of opportunity to maybe get like a little five or ten percent gain, like you, you might have said was easy a year ago. And I just want to give him a huge shout out because that thread is awesome, and he seems like he might even have a crystal ball. But uh, the reality is that crypto is cyclical, and it's just not his first rodeo. Well said, Matt. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, and if that if that is ends up being the case, uh, it's now is kind of the time to like buckle up and uh, get ready for the boredom and. Uh, I think one of the points he includes is there is just like find a way to stay interested. Um, and so kind of grinding away and uh, maybe studying a new protocol or a new sector of DeFi or even like if you were into NFTs, maybe start exploring DeFi or vice versa. Um, it's just about staying interested and staying dedicated. And uh, of course, once once the bear market uh, fades away and back into the bull market, that's when things get exciting again. Uh, so that means there's good times ahead, right? Uh, but uh, changing points here and kind of pivoting over to to one of our flipside dashes. Uh, as we do, as we know, each week we do a flipside dash review. As they're one of our generous sponsors, uh, we really appreciate the the insights and on state on-chain data that they provide, of course, for free. Uh, so, Matt, can you walk us through this uh, dashboard we have up on the screen here? Sure. So this dashboard is looking at Joe Pegs, which is a semi recently launched NFT marketplace on Avalanche on the AVAX Avalanche chain. Um, I believe it launched in June. Avalanche didn't really have NFTs before that. I'm sure that there were projects live, but there was no volume, no exchanges. No one was really trading them. It was kind of not a space that I believe any investors were super interested in. Along with the launch of Joe Pegs in, ex in exchange for trading NFTs launched by Trader Joe, who also runs the biggest decks on, on Avalanche, uh, they came out with the Small Joe NFTs, S-M-O-L Joes. I think Small Joes are still trading at like a $3,000 floor or you know, 275 AVAX, something like that, whatever. They're at a five-figure floor. They're still doing well. Um, there's a lot of volume and people are actually seem interested in, in Avalanche NFTs while 
in my opinion, there's not a, a whole lot else going on on Avalanche right now, um, at least not that I've seen or been that interested in. So, you know, seeing that there's more collections coming out, more volume, if you look at the chart up on the screen right now, you can see the total JPEG sales. Um, you know, it's going up. There's more There's more JPEG selling and, you know, it's on a up and to the right, as Dan would say. So I think that it's interesting to see that this is still something that people are active in and trading and interested in, while it seems that maybe other areas of Avalanche are fading fading off or at least for now i do think that and this is like hot take maybe not true but in my opinion and this is just something i've been thinking a little bit about so not financial advice and not even confident in this but i do think that maybe buying nfts on like one of these l1s is a better rr a better risk reward profile than you know buying the token itself personally i'm not very bullish l1s going into the next bull market at least the l1s that did well in the last bull market but if i was going to gamble on it i think i would probably be interested in buying these kind of like blue chip nfts maybe the first nft something with historic value or something like that so i think it is interesting that we're still seeing uh, a lot of activity on jopeg's nft marketplace absolutely and just one thing i do want to point out here on this chart uh, it is a cumulative chart so it is deceivingly up into the right however we do see some pretty big spikes here uh most namely in the middle of October, as well as towards later of November. Uh, but again, just want to give a, a great shout out to Flipside. They have some of the most comprehensive on-chain data. Again, it's for free. Uh, I can't explain how valuable it is to be able to ask a question uh, to yourself and say, hey, you know, how is this DEX doing so much volume? And being able to have a data set that can just dive right into that data um, and, and really be able to like use SQL queries to answer your own questions. Um, and if that's something you're interested in, we do have a little opportunity for you to claim and earn some USDC. Uh, we have an exclusive 0x research bounty. We'll have a link in the show notes, but definitely uh, if, that's, if that's up your alley, be sure to check it out. Yeah, I also want to take a second to thank our wonderful sponsor, Chainalysis. They're one of the leading crypto analytics providers, and they're helping provide the tools necessary to legitimize our industry. They enable investors to track funds on chain with ease, and they also have some great research uh, on their website that's available for completely free and we'll link to that in the show notes they offer really in-depth courses on all things crypto which are definitely worth checking out chain analysis is building the tools our industry needs so be sure to look at them in the show notes they've been stepping up their twitter thread game too i don't know if you guys noticed that but i feel like i'd never seen a chain analysis thread in the last month or two they've done like three or four really good ones that i was like whoa i love that don't sleep on chain analysis but uh without further ado we got a great in interview with antonio from dydx let's get right to it welcome back Back, everyone. We have a great uh, interview upcoming for you all uh, with the founder and CEO of DYDX, Antonio. Antonio, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, spending some time and hopping on here with us. Really, the, the kind of the meat of what we want to hit on today is DeFi's role in regaining the trust of the industry, uh, given the FTX collapse that we've we've seen over the past couple couple weeks now, and and really how DEXs are built uh, around transparency and kind of like. And, and what, uh, you know, how these models were really built to avoid these exact situations that we're seeing it play out in FTX. Uh, so I'd love to uh, give you the floor to give yourself a brief little intro. And then if you could lead that into kind of just giving us a, a recap of, of what happened with F FTX uh, in your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. So first, maybe a quick background on DYDX before we dive into FTX. So DYDX is one of the leading decentralized exchanges. We trade about a billion dollars a day every day on DYDX, and we're unique compared to most decentralized exchanges in that we're focused on more advanced financial products like financial derivatives. So we've been around for a little over five years now. We're kind of one of the OGs in the DeFi space. Um, but yeah, we've been experiencing some really big growth recently um, and are just kind of excited about the future of the DEX industry overall. So kind of zooming in on what happened with FTX, I think none of this is super proprietary information, but just giving you my view on what happens at a thousand foot view. So I think it mostly started with some negative backlash against SBF and FTX against some of the policy stuff that was going on. Um, so I won't go into too much detail in kind of the overview of what happened on the policy side, but suffice it to say, he was advocating for some policy that could potentially have had pretty negative effects for DeFi. And DYDX and a bunch of others had kind of flagged this as something that could be really problematic. And I think the industry jumped on this in a pretty big way. And just I think it's been really interesting to see how much support there's been for DeFi, both 
in kind of the overall brand and narrative of crypto. Um, and it's really good to see that people continue to be really excited about what DeFi means for the industry long term and see that as something that's really valuable to protect. But back to FTX and, and SBF. So he was advocating for this bill to be passed, the DCCPA, um, which had this kind of provision in it that effectively treated DeFi exchanges the same way, more or less, as centralized exchanges. And we and a lot of other people in the industry think that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's fundamentally new technology. And even if a lot of the platforms wanted to comply, there probably wouldn't have been a path for them to do that under the way the legislation was currently written. So he got a ton of backlash against this. And I think this was kind of the beginning of the end in terms of exposing some of the flaws in the brand narrative around SBF and FTX. And I actually think that was really important and probably the second part wouldn't have happened without this first part. But that was kind of the first part, and that was about a week or two before the ultimate collapse of FTX. Then fast forward another week, and this, uh, I think it was the Block article, um, or, or somebody else had effectively leaked the balance sheet of Alameda trading. Alameda, I'm sure everybody knows at this point, is kind of the sister hedge fund of FTX. And this kind of raised a lot of questions about well, is Alameda solvent? So this seems like they're holding a bunch of these not super liquid assets as collateral and making a lot of loans based off of them. And people were making, at the time, seemingly a lot of conspiracy theories about how this could potentially relate to FTX. A lot of those conspiracy theories ended up being true, right? We didn't know that at the time. Um, but people were questioning, oh, is FTX solvent? Um, how much exposure could they potentially have to this? And fast forward a few more days, and then the really big thing that started happening is people started losing confidence in FTX. Um, and that resulted in this run on the bank situation where tons of people started withdrawing their funds from FTX. I forget what SBF said the total amount requested to be withdrawn from FTX was, but it was a lot, probably on the order of like 50% of the entire assets on the exchange. And there should have been no problem for them to handle, right, if they had just had all of the funds sitting there in cold storage or something secure like that. But that wasn't what was going on, clearly. Um, and I think fast forward one or two more days and we didn't hear anything from SBF or FTX for a day. And everybody was like, hey, what's going on? Um, and keep in mind, all of this was pretty much just playing out on crypto Twitter and in a few crypto native publications as well. But still at this point, most people thought that FTX was totally solvent. There were still some rumors, but the things I was seeing most people say were like, hey, this is pretty sketchy, but yeah, 99.9% .9 chance FTX is solvent, right? <laughs> but still, this is a little bit sketchy. Um, and then I think the bombshell tweet the next morning was SBF tweeting that they were getting acquired by Binance. And I saw this, so I woke up and I think it was morning uh, on the East Coast at the time. And I was like, holy hell, like what the heck? <laughs> how, how could this possibly have happened? Um, I thought it was a joke at first, to be honest, <laughs> kind of a bad joke. But then I saw CZ's tweet effectively confirming it from the other side that at least at that point in time, they were planning to acquire FTX. And then that was just one of the most shocking days I can remember in my entire eight or so year career working in crypto. Um, and I think if we zoom out and give a little bit of context to this moment, too, I think it was really significant because of the amount of trust and brand value that FTX and SBF had built up at that point. Um, I think they had made it a huge point to be one of the leading narratives in crypto, like they were putting themselves out there in Washington, like I mentioned before, in a really big way. Um, they're running a bunch of ad campaigns, obviously, SBF himself was doing a really good job building his personal brand in crypto. And it was a really concerted effort to kind of become the main narrative in crypto. And I think that's really interesting how much people, how much just kind of brand value and stock people put in FTX, almost even beyond the amount of volume and adoption that they had. I don't mean to, to kind of belittle the amount of traction they had. They were one of the biggest exchanges in crypto, but you know, they were trading relatively similar volume to like an OKX or a Huobi or something like that. And they had way more brand value, almost to the level, potentially even more than the level of a Binance who had 5x more 
you know, enterprise value, volume, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think, and I'll stop there in the story. We can keep going if it's of interest, but uh, I think this was certainly one of the most shocking days I can remember in crypto. Um, and I think has a ton of downstream effects, both for DeFi and the rest of the industry. If you can't tell, we love data here at Blockroots Research. And Chainalysis, the leading blockchain analytics company, shares this passion with us. We use data to extract alpha and find the next thing coming in DeFi, but Chainalysis is doing the gritty work and building trust in blockchains. To onboard the next trillion dollars of capital into the industry, we need to grow safe consumer access to cryptocurrency and promote more financial freedom with less risk. Chainalysis has some of the most comprehensive and reliable data in the space, and they use this data to power a full suite of their solutions that can be utilized by industry professionals. Best-in-class training and certifications are also led by Chainalysis and some of the brightest minds in the space. If you haven't heard of Chainalysis, you got to check them out, and we'll link to them in the show notes. I'm curious, what do you think the long-term ramifications of all this is for centralized exchanges? Do you think maybe they'll try and incorporate like self-custodial accounts, or do you think they're just way behind the curve and all the activity is going to migrate to DeFi? What are your thoughts there? Try to integrate self-custodial accounts at some point. I think that's pretty far down the line, um, probably five to ten years down the line, if I had to guess, and potentially even never. Um, I do see some positive movement from centralized exchanges in terms of transparency, specifically around things like exchanges stepping up and doing proof of reserves. Slight tangent, but I think some of the proof of reserves as they currently stand are a step in the right direction, sure, but they are a bit problematic as well in that they really don't tell the whole story, right? Um, even if Binance says they have, you know, I don't remember exactly what the amount is, but say $10 billion of crypto or whatever the case may be, you know, how do you know that that sums up to all of the balances on the exchange? Um, and even if you know what the some of the balances on the exchange are, you don't know what the liabilities of the exchange were. So even if FTX had done this, you wouldn't have been able to see their liabilities to Alameda or whoever else they had. Um, so it really wouldn't have solved kind of the root problem here. With that being said, I think the move towards transparency and the industry demanding that is a positive step. Um, I think longer term, and this is kind of what I talked about to the DYDX team right after this happened. Obviously, this gives me a ton more conviction in what we're building in DYDX and in DeFi more broadly. That's always been the goal, is to try to build a financial system that is transparent, that is secure, and where this kind of stuff just fundamentally can't happen, right? And I think it's unfortunately, a lot of times, takes times like this for people to realize that that's the case. Um, I think just humans are really bad at predicting tail risks and even kind of understanding tail risks, right? Um, but things like exchange blowups, things like security hacks, uh, just are you know 10x worse than the kind of positive value you might get out of using a slightly better, incrementally better product. Um, so I think it's really important that the crypto industry does move more towards DeFi over time. That being said, I still think that is a little ways away. I like to think we're at the forefront of pushing forward what's possible on the product side with DeFi at DYDX. Um, but even for us, I, I think it's probably five to 10 years from now until DeFi starts really competing with CeFi head to head from like a metrics perspective. Um, I just think that this technological change takes longer than people think. And I actually think that's kind of the root cause behind a lot of the price action, behind a lot of the hype action that we sp see in the space overall. Right. Like, I think the narratives in crypto almost from the very beginning have been right, basically. Like, you can be your own bank. That, like, absolutely was a real narrative that has played out with Bitcoin. With DeFi, it's like, you can be your own exchange. We can create this financial system that's based on code. And we're getting there. There's some really useful products like DYDX, Uniswap, Compound Aave, and others that exist right now. Yes, they don't have the metrics that centralized products have yet. Um, and I think that kind of makes this dynamic play out where, you know, there's a new narrative that's fundamentally, fundamentally enabled by a new technology, but then the technology kind of sucks. Then like people get excited about it, right? But then the technology kind of sucks. So people are like, oh, this is shit. Like, you know, dump all the prices, you know, DeFi, DeFi sucks, like I'm out. Um, and then a little bit more time goes on and like the next generation of products are built and people are again, like, 
oh, wow, like this could be the future, but then people get too excited about it. And then it, you know, booms and busts and booms and busts. But directionally, it's up and to the right. And I think we've seen that with crypto since the early days. And now we're kind of seeing that play out with DeFi as well. Um, but zooming back in, what is this? What does the FTX debacle mean for DeFi in the short and medium and long terms? I think long term, it's really positive. And like I mentioned, does really speak to the need for what we're building. I think in the short to medium term, um, it could potentially, well, it definitely will be negative for crypto overall. Just there's going to be overall a lot fewer people trading crypto as people lose faith in the industry there could potentially be some negative regulatory backlash on both centralized and even potentially decentralized exchanges and i think it's generally just going to make it harder for everybody um, in the near to medium term call it the next one to three years or so uh, but it makes me a lot more optimistic for the long term and that's really what we've always tried to build for at dydx yeah that actually seg segues me well into the next question which is you know with centralized exchanges they're pretty sticky because like kyc and getting a bank account set up like it's a big process but then in DeFi, you know you have open source code and you know there's increased competition because people can just fork it and then you've also got um, really low friction to move from one protocol to another and you know people vampiring attacking liquidity how do you view actually creating a sticky product in DeFi? Um, and, and how do you retain kind of a moat? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually think it's pretty similar to the way you do it in centralized exchanges as well. You do it through brand predominantly, and that's not to say it's some like big marketing sham or something like that. I think the fundamental technology really plays into the brand, right? And that's what we've, we're have we always talking about on these podcasts, right? We're sitting here saying, yeah, this is the future of finance that's governed by code, it's transparent, it's secure, and that's brand, right? Um, it is kind of a, a concise encapsulation of why you might want to use these products. So let's maybe take a specific example um, and maybe a, a third party example that's not DYDX, but take something like Uniswap. Um, like why does, why was Uniswap way more successful than SushiSwap? Um, now the products are like a little bit divergent, right? So maybe there's some differences from a product perspective, but right after SushiSwap forked Uniswap, and if anything, probably threw uh, more fuel on the fire with the token, the Sushi token, which came out before the Uni token, right? Like, why was that not successful? And I think it really comes back to brand. Even right after the fork, Uniswap had a good amount more volume. And I think that's just because people trusted the Uniswap brand. Um, it was a website they knew. It was like a team and product that they knew. Um, and even fast forward to now, if you look at the amount of volume that's going through like a uniswap.org, even compared to a DEX aggregator, there's more going through uniswap.org, which if you think about it as a product maxi, like actually doesn't really make sense because you get objectively better pricing by using a DEX aggregator than you do on Uniswap. No shade at all to Uniswap. I think they're the best uh, spot decentralized exchange, but I think it really speaks to the power of brands that they've been able to build as an example. Um, and I think it's really the, the same case if you look at something like an FTX, and that was kind of where I started my story, right? Because I think it's a really important backdrop to literally the fact that they were misappropriating user funds. They lost the faith of the community and their brand really started to, to suffer. And I think if you look at the, the companies that have been really successful for centralized exchanges, like Binance, first and foremost, they've done a great job of building up a brand. You know, CZ's always out here tweeting like safety first, safety first, like users first, users first. And of course, that's what you want to see if you're a trader in the space. Um, I think DYDX and decentralized exchanges more broadly can kind of do a 10x better job eventually of creating that brand. And it's not going to be with thousand person marketing deposits it's because enough people are going to get it and they're going to understand, hey, this is a new financial system that's built on code, not on intermediaries. And that's like the best brand you can have from a transparency and security perspective. So that's how I think you really create a moat in DeFi and probably in crypto in general. Um, and I think it's actually probably more similar to a centralized exchange from like a go to market perspective than people realize. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even when the, in the in like the early days of the, in the early days, like a couple of weeks ago when FTX was truly collapsing, right, we saw this you know, significant exodus of users 
moving their funds from centralized exchanges to their uh, self-hosted wallets. And I know we saw $6 billion of Ethereum and stablecoins uh, leave exchanges over that period. Um, you know, and then the question is, well, where's this money flowing, right? Uh, and if you guys have a great uh, metrics dashboard on your, on your website and, you know, looking at that week starting November 6th, right? $10 billion of weekly volume, which is levels not seen since May, a 67% increase uh, in week over week active takers, and a 250% increase in week over week unique depositors. So you really see that, you know, when FTX really started falling apart, there was this demand for this transparent, trustless alternative. Um, and, and it does come down to, you know, maybe this is the shift that the market needed. And like when you talk about short term versus long term trade offs, right? Like, Maybe this is like a, a you know some, a, some short-term suffering we needed to do for some long-term success and kind of shaking out some of these bad actors, um, and I guess you know really what I'd want to see or I want to hear from you is you know when you think about what DYDX needs to be like truly offering the same experience as a centralized exchange like what do you what are the things that you think are missing today um, you know some of the things that like a key component of a decentralized exchange, right, is liquidity. So how do you think about getting like reliable and deep liquidity uh, on your protocol? Yeah, that's been a big focus for us over the past year or two and for the protocol more broadly. Um, one of the things, one of the interesting things that DYDX as a protocol has done in, since uh, the launch of the DYDX token is kind of point liquidity mining at liquidity provision on the exchange. And for those who aren't aware, DYDX is not an automated market maker. It's an order book based exchange. And that's pretty intentional because we feel it gives us the best ability to create really liquid and deep markets. Um, but it's a trade off, right? It's not objectively better than automated market makers. And the trade off the protocol is making here is that you require kind of more professional liquidity providers, basically crypto hedge funds to step in and provide a lot of this liquidity. Um, and on centralized exchanges, they're normally incentivized to do this, like the centralized exchange will do things like give them loans, potentially give them monthly rebates, potentially give them preferential fee tiers, all to kind of incentivize them to provide better liquidity on their exchange versus competitors. And that's kind of the approach we've taken as a protocol towards getting liquidity on DYDX as well. And with DYDX, we can actually do something that's super unique and that I mentioned before, in that we can point the liquidity mining or part of it directly at this liquidity provision. Um, and effectively, what was done is that there was a formula that was come up with that effectively scored the quality of liquidity these professional liquidity providers were providing to the platform. Um, and then you can use that formula, it effectively will give everyone a score. Like um, Wintermute gets like a 10 score for liquidity this epoch or some other market maker gets uh, like a five. And then you can use that to divvy up the liquidity rewards, the token rewards that these players are getting. So there's literal incentives um, and it's not exactly the same thing that centralized exchanges are doing, but we and others who kind of came up with this effectively use that as the, the background for how we think about this from first principles, like how can we incentivize liquidity providers through the protocol? Um, so that's kind of the first way. And then kind of zooming out and taking your question, like what does the protocol need to do overall to be able to compete more directly with centralized exchanges? I think there's a lot still to be done on the UI UX side. Um, again, I like to think DYDX is really at the forefront of this. And one of the things that keeps me excited about building in DeFi and building on blockchain technology is that the speed of execution and, and the speed of improvement for blockchain technology has been exponential. Maybe it hasn't been as fast as some of us want, but it still has been exponential. Like we can process multiples more transactions every year. Uh, the latency is lower, kind of the complexity of applications we can build on top of various blockchains is significantly higher year over year. Um, and I think a result of that is that whichever protocols want to be successful long term really need to keep building on the new technologies that continue to be multiples better than the old ones. Um, at DYDX, we've really taken this to heart and our current product, which has been live for over a year, I think almost a year and a half now, if not longer, is a layer two exchange. Um, we've been on layer two before most people even knew what it was um, and in partnership with Starkware. And that's really given 
uh, at least 10x, if not more, improvement to our product experience. It's given things like users can trade with no gas fees, right? And that's a huge improvement over paying $10 plus for every trade you might want to make. Um, it gives things like much lower latency. And we're really looking to continue that into the future. Um, we can dive a lot more into this uh in, in a sec, but the biggest thing that we're working on right now is the next version of the protocol. And really the goal for us there is to keep a lot of the great performance improvements we've been able to get with our layer two protocol, um, but add full decentralization as well. And that's a really tough task, right? It's really tough to, like people always talk about this trilemma of decentralization and, and scalability. Um, but it's tough to get everything that, that you might want to have. Um, but really, we're trying to push forward and use some of the new technologies that are available to us. Like specifically, we're building the next version of the protocol v4 with our own Cosmos based blockchain um, and kind of moving off of the Ethereum landscape. And we can dive a lot more into that. Um, but we really feel like it gives us the best opportunity to potentially build the best possible product long term. Um, saying just a little bit more about what DeFi needs to do, I think, from a product perspective, I think UI UX is really critical. Um, it's just a lot of basic things, right? Like, how are we going to be competitive with Binance when on a lot of platforms, at least, people are still paying upwards of $10 in transaction fees for a single trade or action, right? That's ridiculous, right? That's clearly worse. Um, there are some things that are obviously better about DeFi, like the transparency, the security, even some UI things, like it's actually way easier to onboard to most DeFi platforms because you just connect your wallet. You don't have to go through this lengthy onboarding process of doing KYC, like setting up your 2FA for all these different accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think DeFi needs to lean into that and do more of that long term and kind of figure out these potentially 10x better ways that we can actually build better products through ease of onboarding, through things like composability, then centralized exchanges and financial products can. And that's really something that we're looking to lean into at DYDX, but it does take time to build as the technology is still pretty nascent, right? I mean, decentralized exchanges were really just invented like six or seven years ago. Um, and fast forward to now, we're trying to compete with some of the biggest financial products in the world. And that's a tough task, but I think even the fact that we're in the conversation now um, in a big way, gives me a lot of hope for what's possible to build in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see Dan chomping at the bit to ask you about some of the, some of the V4 rollout details, but uh, I want to ask you one question real quick that's kind of boring, but uh, got to get your take on it. What do you think the regulatory fallout from the FTX situation is and maybe how it pertains to DYDX? Yeah, I mean, I think the knee-jerk reaction from most regulators will be to overregulate the crypto space. And absolutely, there should be some regulation on the crypto space, probably a good amount more than there is right now. Um, the major distinction I think I and probably most people who understand what's going on in the crypto space would make is between centralized financial products and decentralized financial products, right? But I think there's a huge amount for us still to do on the education side for policy. And that's been something we're really trying to step up our game on at DYDX. Um, we actually are just bringing on a head of policy. I'm spending some more of my own time on this and really just trying to approach it, not necessarily so much right now, at least as, hey, like we want these specific things to be passed or not passed, but more from an education perspective and getting the word out there, right? Just literally saying exactly the same things that we're saying on, I'm saying on this podcast right now. Like, hey, DeFi fixes this. If this were DYDX instead of FTX, there's no way Antonio could have, you know, lent all the funds to some hedge fund and, and blown everyone's money, right? It's just fundamentally impossible. And the fact that that's the case, even though DeFi is super nascent, I think makes it really exciting potentially for, for a lot of regulators objectives, right? And that's really the case that us and a lot of other really great people um, in the DeFi Education Fund, Blockchain Association, to name a few am amongst others, are really trying to go out and do. Um, but all that being said, I think we're playing from behind here. And I think there is just a ton of scrutiny in on crypto from the entire world. I mean, I opened up my phone today and opened up the New York Times and literally the first thing was like FTX and, uh, you know, the New York Times talking about how they were misappropriating customer funds and all these things. And if you're a policymaker, 
you read the same news, right? And you look at that and you're like, holy shit, we need to regulate crypto. Um, and like I was saying, that's not necessarily a bad reaction, right? A lot of these, especially overseas exchanges, have been allowed to exist outside of the regulatory framework for a long time. Um, but the main thing I would ask and advocate for is that as a lot of this policy is being crafted, that it's at least done with the understanding of what DeFi offers. Um, I wrote kind of a long tweet thread uh, on this uh, a week or two ago, um, but I was basically going through a lot of the core policy principles that uh, the CFTC puts into like how clearinghouses are regulated. And they go through a lot of these principles and, you know, you think about regulation usually as what are literally are the laws. But I think if you go a level deeper, it's pretty interesting to try to understand that. Right. And a lot of the principles are things that are really common sense. It's like, OK, the exchange should make sure that when it does a trade, both sides have the funds. OK, like obviously we should do that. But like in CFI, you need regulation to to enforce that that's the case. Um, but a lot of these things are potentially 10x better in DeFi, right? It's like, OK, if you're Uniswap or the DYDX smart contract, it does it by default. Um, or a lot of regulation pertains to transparency, like customers should understand where their funds are um, and the custodian shouldn't like lend them out or do other sketchy things with them. It's like, OK, this is like pretty simple. Like we can all agree like this should be the case. I think a lot of people in crypto kind of have the misassumption that it's like us versus the regulators or whatever. And I think un unfortunately that has been the case in, in some ways. But it's really not the case long term, I think. And it's really not the case if both sides are able to kind of understand from first principles what the other side is trying to do. But I think even if that's the case, it does take a huge amount of legwork and a huge amount of effort to uh, convince people that that's the case and really educate them on, on what's possible and really what we and other really good people are trying to build in DeFi. Yeah, there's definitely some irony there that, you know, if you're a centralized or if you're, you know, a regulator and you're thinking about how we resolve or remedy the situation, you're like, oh, well, we need how do we solve this? And, and the reality is, you know, we have teams in crypto that have been uh, building on uh, creating the code to exactly solve these problems. So, you know, I'm glad to hear that you and your team are working on this because my, I do fear personally that uh, we might get some overarching blanket regulation that kind of constricts, constricts the uh, the growth of the industry. Of course, that's like my, my bear case. but. Uh, uh, yeah, again, really glad to hear that we're pushing forward in the right direction there. And before we kind of pivot over to some of the V4 DYDX chain stuff, I kind of want to get your take on how you view risk management of like listed assets. So one of the theories I saw circulating in the heat of uh, the FTX collapse is how did Alameda actually lose ten billion dollars? Right, that's just it's not it's not exactly it's not exactly an easy thing to do. Um, and one of the theories out there was they actually acted as the insurance fund or the the backstop in the liquidation mechanism. Um, and, you know, so going back to earlier in May when we saw Terra Luna unwind, you know, the Luna price collapse was extremely rapid. Uh, we saw, you know, even one minute candles that were significant percent decreases. Uh, and so th there's a theory that like this kind of put the initial hole uh, or, or hole in the boat of Alameda. And so, you know, currently you guys have a vote live uh, on your governance platform to wind down the safety module. Uh, mostly around the proposals kind of talks about how it's mostly around, you know, more of like an illusion of safety. And it's like if DYDX were to experience some issues, uh, then, you know, the, the insurance fund likely would experience losses as well. And the tokens would kind of have to be swapped from DYDX tokens to USDC. Uh, so I'd love to just get your take on kind of how you see uh, building out a safety module. Is that something that's even necessary? Uh, and really just risk management around which assets get listed and how, uh, it, how the protocol is susceptible to these price movements. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great question and a really big and kind of deep technical topic here. Um, on the first piece with kind of the financial stability of call it the derivatives contracts on FTX and other platforms. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly a theory at this point. I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, but I would also guess that the bulk of funds that Alameda lost were more based on a lot of their venture investments and probably lending activities that they were doing just the notional value of a lot of these derivative contracts. I'd be surprised if it were high enough that just from bad liquidations or losing money on liquidations, they could have lost that much money. But that being said, like it absolutely is a risk. Um, and I think one that just takes a lot of financial modeling to look at what are the appropriate risk parameters to set for a lot of these financial contracts. Um, 
we do a lot of work behind and others do a lot of work behind the scenes to set those parameters effectively um, on DYDX. And I think the advantage of something like DYDX is first of all, that it's transparent. I mean, I've said that a million times, but I'll keep saying it. Um, so at least you can see what all the parameters are on these contracts. You can see and verify exactly the balance of the insurance fund, et cetera, et cetera. And then also that anybody can kind of step in and help to govern a lot of these parameters on the protocol. And one of the interesting and I think exciting things about DYDX governance specifically is there's a lot of really good people that are participating in it right now. And a lot of people that really know what they're talking about, like some of the biggest participants in DYDX governance have been a lot of the trading firms and also a lot of the really good kind of more research focused uh, firms uh, that are looking at a lot of these DeFi protocols. Um, and I think just the fact that a lot of people can come together and express opinions, express positive opinions, express potential risks and negative opinions um, kind of bodes well for the future of risk management on a lot of these DeFi platforms. And I think we've seen that be the case for a while now. Um, again, like the insurance fund on DYDX is totally transparent. Um, and I think we lost something like $10,000 out of the insurance funds right after the FTX, the volatility after the FTX collapse. And to give people a sense of scope, the DYDX insurance fund, I think, has like $15 million in it right now. So it's like a really negligible uh, loss based off of that. Um, and it's all transparent, at least. Um, what you were talking about with kind of the DYDX safety pool as well, I think does play into this a little bit. That's slightly separate from setting appropriate and kind of safe risk parameters across the contracts themselves. Um, but kind of the original thesis behind having that fund was just to have some backstop liquidity um, and effectively funds to be able to step in in the event that the protocol loses money and it eats through um, so, sorry, maybe taking a step back, there's like two different insurance funds on DYDX. The first insurance fund is really financially similar to how the insurance funds work for perpetuals on Binance, um, FTX, and other platforms in that they're paid into as people uh, get liquidated on the platform. So it sort of like slowly grows. And then if there are times when there's extreme volatility and you can't liquidate people fast enough, then that insurance funds will like drop, potentially drop in value. Um, this is a very rare occurrence. And like I was just mentioning, hasn't really happened very much at all on DYDX. Um, so that's the first insurance fund. That's not going anywhere. Second, like insurance fund is more of a protocol level insurance fund. Um, and on DYDX, the way this worked was pretty simple. There was a smart contract where users could stake DYDX tokens um, in exchange for some newly minted supply, basically liquidity mining, staking rewards on DYDX. And kind of the problem, and you alluded to this, um, that some people had raised on the governance forums is that it's reflexive, kind of in a negative way, right? So suppose there were, you know, God forbid, a huge security vulnerability or just like fun some financial attack on DYDX and the protocol started losing a lot of money, probably that would impact the token price. So at the time you need it the most, the amount of funds like in this insurance pool um, that is all made up of DYDX tokens would go down and then people would see that there was a hack or there was an exploit or whatever. And then they would also see that, oh, hey, like what is the insurance fund going to do in this situation? Probably it's gonna sell off some of these DYDX tokens to try to repay back the protocol. So that would drive down the price even more. Um, and then it just kind of creates this vicious cycle where potentially you know, the price of the token goes down a lot and even worse than that, the amount of funds that are earmarked for kind of recapitalizing the protocol in this case could be less. Um, so I think like the first step, and this is kind of what's being discussed in the governance forums right now, is potentially to remove this and potentially replace it with something better long term. And that's something we're thinking about and the, pro the community more broadly is thinking about for, for V4. Um, but there still exists this kind of first level insurance fund. Um, and of course, the DYDX and any token governance for this matter can kind of appropriate funds out of the community funds however they see fit. So like even if there were some exploit or something like that, the community could still, if they wanted to, step in and, and recapitalize things without the literally just having funds locked in the insurance fund.
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And on the same topic of governance, like I feel like no one's really figured that one out yet. And DYDX is kind of pioneering like a new governance structure with the sub DAOs. Do you mind diving into that a little bit and also uh, explaining how that might fold into the DYDX chain and V4? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, just a disclaimer, uh, all of this thinking was more put out by the DYDX Foundation, which I'm not a part of. Um, but that being said, I did read the blog post um, and have some decent understanding of it. So I think the high level idea that was kind of put forth and is still being discussed by the community is to have more, as you say, uh, sub DAOs to manage more different types of functions throughout the protocol. Um, the things the foundation was talking about in this post were things like potentially a growth sub DAO. So like, how could the protocol do marketing long term? Oh, it probably makes sense to have some group of people that's overseen by the protocol to go out and be able to do that. Or how could the protocol do customer support long term? Like, clearly, that's a really important part of any product. Um, but as the protocol really pushes forward towards not only decentralizing the product, but decentralizing the organization as well. Um, I think this is a way to do it that makes a lot of sense, right? Just kind of organizing these different functional groups that are pretty separate um, into kind of plug and play organizations, more or less, that can be owned and, and overseen by um, the DAO, like the, the master DAO, if you will, of DYDX token holders themselves. Um, so I, I think there were some ideas like the growth one, the uh, customer support one. Um, there, I think, also was a operation sub DAO that they proposed to kind of make it easy to make and you know administrate all the other DAOs because it's actually quite hard um, to like spin up all these legal entities. Like nobody really knows what it means to like be employed by a DAO yet. Um, so what does that mean? Um, and how can we have just a lot of really plug and play infrastructure? as a protocol for a lot of these sub DAOs long term. So I think it's still something that's being discussed and does have decentralization trade offs. But I think it's a really interesting and kind of exciting way to pursue this like second, but also really important goal of decentralizing not just the protocol, but the organization and call it just like group of people behind the protocol itself. Um, so I'm excited to, to see more discussion of that going forwards. Yeah, we're still kind of feels like we're trying to uh, discover the silver bullet within D5, like what the best governance model really does look like. Uh, we've seen uh, some good experimentation with with kind of what this sub down model looks like. So I'm excited to, you know, see another protocol discussing really pushing that that forward. Um, but that kind of like kicks us off into this the V4 section of this, which as Sam uh, alluded to earlier, I'm super excited to get into. Um, I know you all have been working on DYDX chain for a couple months now, and that's a pretty massive undertaking, kind of starting your own chain up from scratch. So I'd love to just get a general update on on how the last couple months have gone and, and where you all stand with the, with the build today. Yeah, absolutely. So we've probably been working on it for nine months plus at this point. Um, and fast forward to now, pretty much the entire team at least the entire engineering and product team is laser focused on V4, um, which is the same thing as the DYDX chain. And as the name suggests, and as I mentioned before, the thing that we're building here is our own blockchain. And the way that we're doing that is developing based on the Cosmos SDK, um, which is kind of a plug and play way to spin up uh, your own blockchain. Um, I talked some about this in my initial blog post and on a couple different podcasts and stuff more around the time that was announced, so I won't go too deep into it right now unless that's of interest. Um, but the main reason that we decided to build our own chain is to decentralize really the core part that is centralized on DYDX v3 right now. And the core part that is centralized on DYDX v3 right now is the matching engine and kind of the order book. Um, we effectively run that in, in a centralized way through our company right now. The protocol in v3 is still totally uh, non-custodial and smart contract based, but we do run the order book and order matching engine for performance reasons. Um, you might ask, why do we do this? And the reason is that it's really hard to decentralize an order book and an order matching engine. And the amazing reason for that is because matching engines require a really high level of scalability. To kind of give you a sense um, on the DYDX v3 matching engine right now, we process about a thousand orders per second. Um, and matching engines for platforms like Binance or like the New York Stock Exchange process orders of magnitudes more operations per second um, than we do. 
Um, but we, uh, we, we, you know, wanted to fully decentralize the protocol. That's really aligns with the ethos of what we're trying to build and, and what makes sense for DeFi long term. So we kind of took a step back and thought about, well, how can we at least attain an equivalent level of performance to the DYDX v3 matching engine right now with call it on average a thousand orders placed and canceled per second. Um, and we took a look around at all the different scalability solutions. Um, you know, right now we're built on top of Starkware, um, which is a layer two roll up on top of Ethereum, looked at other layer two roll ups. We looked at scalable layer one chains like Solana and a few others. Obviously we looked at building our own chain and we asked ourselves, hey, which of these platforms can support a thousand orders placed and canceled per second? And not only that, but with really low latency and also with ideally little or no gas fees, right? Because market makers really don't want to pay a lot of gas fees just to be able to put quotes on the book. Um, and the answer we got back was none of them, not even close. <laughs> um, so we went back to the drawing board and we were like, okay, well, that's cool. Like we want to build this order book based decentralized exchange and we can't do it on any blockchain. So what are we going to do? And the answer we came up with, I think is pretty novel and we're pretty excited about and really is uniquely enabled by Cosmos, thus the story. Um, but the answer we came up with is to build an off-chain but decentralized order book and matching engine. And the way we're doing that is we're coding it directly into uh, the open source software of the validator, sort of as like a sidecar that they run. Um, and this is really uniquely enabled by Cosmos, right? Because you, um, as the developers, effectively uh, can write into the open source software what the validators are going to be doing, right? And some of the things the validators are doing is normal old consensus stuff. Um, and some of the things could be whatever else you want. So it could be like coming to consensus on what the orders placed and canceled should be. But if you do it this way, all of the orders that are placed and canceled never actually make it on chain. They still are decentralized in the fact that they're being stored by the validators, but it's really the same concept as a mempool um, in Ethereum and any other blockchain for that matter where the order book only exists in the mempool and then only the matched orders actually ever go into the consensus version of the state of the chain. And this is really important because on order books, roughly 1% or less of orders ever even get matched. So just doing this gives us like a 100x increase in scalability um, without sacrificing any decentralization, with getting literally free gas costs, right? Because you don't have to pay gas if things never even get mined on chain. Um, and it was just an overall 10x potentially better product experience for us to build. So that's kind of the core thing that we have been building for these past couple months. We actually just earlier, uh, you know, this morning released some news that we have completed what we're terming milestone two of the development process. And Milestone 2 effectively is an internal working version of the core trading experience. Um, so we have this test net up and running internally right now. Um, there are bots that are placing orders, that are canceling orders. The validators that we have running internally for the test net are coming to consensus on the orders that are placed. Um, there's things like liquidations, et cetera, happening. Um, but yeah, we're pretty excited about the progress that we have made so far. Um, and happy to dive into to a lot more of that and kind of where we're going in the future. But you're absolutely right. Building your own chain is pretty hard mode when it comes to development. There's just quite a lot to do. Um, there's a lot of things you wouldn't normally expect. Maybe just to give one specific example of that. Another thing that we're building in addition to the core validator software is what we're calling an indexer, which is sort of an entire another layer that exists from the blockchain itself. Um, it's sort of something similar to a really custom built version of like an Alchemy or an Infura or something like that. But the really cool part about this is that the indexer is going to be open source as well. So anybody can run an indexer. There could be reference indexers that probably some of the uh, front ends will use, but it's actually a good bit more decentralized even from like an indexing perspective than pretty much anything else that's out there right now. 
Um, but the indexer will do things like stream all of the data about what trades have happened on the chain, what orders have been placed, et cetera, et cetera. And then it'll translate it into a format that's really custom made for DYDX. And what do I mean by that? It'll literally, literally create a REST API that's really similar to a centralized exchange, but for all of the data that exists on the blockchain. So there could be like a REST API that's like, get my orders placed for like, you know, the, the past uh, year or whatever, um, and it'll return it. And it's just a much more efficient and much better product experience to go through this versus going directly to the chain itself for all of the read level queries. Um, that's actually like a huge undertaking. Building the indexer is like almost as complicated as building the blockchain itself, um, but something that goes on a little bit more behind the scenes and is something that we're really focused on to drive the best possible product experience. But there's quite a lot to build, but we're making good progress, TLDR. Well, as a data junkie myself, hearing the, the creation of the indexer really, that's, that seems to be like a novel, novel creation that you know, makes data more accessible. Uh, and as somebody who's like addicted to building qu queries on blockchain data, that gets my interest going. Uh, but I do want to dive a little deeper on this, uh, the order book you're, you're creating, right? So if, if nothing's ever committed to chain, uh, then it, would that mean that every uh, validator would be holding like a slightly different uh, order book or would they all somehow still be similar? You're right. Every validator will have a slightly different version of the order book. We feel like that's a really acceptable trade-off because the latency should pretty be pretty low for the propagation of a lot of these orders. And then it's also the incentives are really aligned with the validators too, right? Like the validators want to have more orders because they make money when the trades happen. So they like actively are incentivized to store better liquidity. Um, it is a slightly, you know, fundamentally different like trading experience from trading on just one version of the order book. But we've talked to a lot of the firms that are currently trading on DYDX V3 right now and some users um, and still feel like we'll be able to make a really great trading experience, even with this effectively uh, non, you know, slightly different versions of the order book running on different validators. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because whenever I hear, you know, mempool and then validator set in the same sentence, my mind jumps to MEV. So with your order book model, is that going to play a role? And if so, does the MEV flow to DYDX token holders in the revamp tokenomics? So this is still something we're thinking about uh, in pretty early stages to be transparent in the development process right now. Um, not to write it off, but I think MEV is a problem on any decentralized exchange and is a really, really hard problem to solve. Um, but I think, again, building our own blockchain does give us better tools to be able to attack it than building on a more generalized chain where like the validators really aren't incentivized at all to care about your application, you know, in particular compared to other applications. Um, and then again, you just don't have as much influence over them because you don't have anything to do with the consensus process. Um, so I don't want to go too much into it right now because it's really something we're still thinking through, but we're exploring a lot of different paths. I think one of the things that we're thinking about, at least uh, starting with, is more transparency as to what the validators are doing. Um, and I think if you, again, try to make sure the stakers are aligned with the overall success of the protocol, and then you combine that with giving a lot of transparency in terms of what's going on on the validators, um, and it's hard to do, but if you look at things like validators, even before they mine a block committing to what the ordering of the transactions is um, sort of in real time, or you look at things like what's the average execution price or like the average amount of slippage you might get on validator A versus validator B, you can sort of run some analytics where you're like, oh, validator A is um, you know, probably doing a good amount of MEV, so let's adjust our stake weights against them and kind of make the incentives for the validators, at least in the long term, not make sense for them to do MEV and try to just make them more aligned with the protocol overall. So that's kind of the first layer of attack. Um, the second layer of attack, again, we're really starting to just think through at a high level, um, but the Cosmos enables some pretty interesting things in terms of kind of collaboration between validators. There's basically this step in the Cosmos and Tendermint consensus process where you can get like effectively all the other validators to like comment or like give data or like approve or disapprove what's in a certain block. 
Um, so just as a high level thought, we're kind of exploring, are there ways for all the validators to kind of act together in concert to come up with like, what is the actual state of the matches that happen versus just like literally whoever the leader is um, kind of proposing, you know, you know, whatever they want. So those are the kind of ways we're thinking about attacking it long term. Um, but definitely it's still a work in progress and I think is still more in the research phase for both us and, and other chains. Yeah, it's cool to, you know, when you, when you think about like building on an app specific chain, you get this extra de design space of the validator set. So using them uh, to kind of like build out what your chain can do or what your protocol can do and how you design that uh, is super exciting to see someone like pushing forward and, and you know, pushing what's what can be done uh, in that's in that side of the equation. Um, of course, leaving a general purpose chain, you do have some trade offs, of course. Uh, and so like on a general purpose chain, such as Ethereum, you already have this massive base of users that already has assets that are compatible with your protocol. Uh, so how do you guys think about uh, like the, solving the bridging problem and moving assets onto DYDX chain? And does the you know, USDC uh, and Circle chain coming to the Cosmos, does that kind of, uh, do you plan to use that in any way? Or I'm just curious to get your take on how you think about bringing in the users to assets. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, it's a lot easier for us versus a spot decentralized exchange because we only need the collateral asset or potentially in the future assets that will support to, be, to exist on the chain. And then we can just synthetically create all the other derivative contracts people want to trade off those assets. So right now, DYDX is single collateral in that we only support USDC as collateral on V3. And at least for the launch of V4, that'll almost definitely be the case as well, that only USDC is supported as collateral. Um, thinking about multi-collateral for the longer term, but probably not out of the gates. Um, but yeah, we absolutely do plan to use, barring some catastrophe or something, the newly to be created uh, native USDC chain that's being created in the Cosmos ecosystem. We actually have been talking quite a lot with Circle um, and some of the other players like uh, Zaki and some of the Core Cosmos team to really try to push for this to happen um, because we really saw it as a huge security and also decentralization kind of win for the Cosmos ecosystem to have something like this. Um, and it's going to make it just a much better product experience on DYDX. So we definitely will use it. Um, and I think there are two potential things we're thinking about for bridging right now as to how users are going to get assets over to the DYDX chain. Um, the first thing is a little bit more long term. We're trying to push on Circle and USDC to build this sooner rather than later. Um, but effectively, what they're thinking of building, and, and they released a public blog post about this not too long ago, so I can talk about it, um, is kind of their own bridge, more or less, where they'll support or at least help facilitate supporting um, users exchanging USDC on one chain and then kind of attesting to that fact where like you could like burn your USDC on Ethereum basically and then they'll pass you a message which lets you mint uh, USDC on whatever other chain. So it's sort of like a bridge um, but it's really specifically tailor-made just for USDC. Um, so we'd like to use that long term. Not exactly sure when that will be ready. The other thing we're considering starting with is using another bridge um, it's not sure exactly which one yet, but potentially something like Axelar um, to allow USDC to be, to be bridged from Ethereum and potentially other chains. Um, and the cool thing about using the bridge is you can use the bridge. So you basically bridge Ethereum or USDC from like Ethereum um, and then we'll bridge it over probably to like Osmosis or some other chain like that that has a spot decentralized exchange. And then we'll trade it for native USDC and this will all happen in the course of like a couple minutes. So like, yes, you're using the bridge, but you only have a few minutes of exposure to it, right? Um, and then you swap it for the native USDC, and then that can be transferred to the DYDX chain using IBC, which is very secure and decentralized. Um, so this all sounds fairly complicated, but we're effectively planning to build all of this in behind the scenes into just the DYDX clients themselves. Um, so from a user perspective, it's actually going to be pretty sweet, I think. Um, we'll effectively just have a way that users can click one button or even potentially send funds to an address. Um, and it'll look like a centralized exchange. It'll be like, okay, click to deposit to DYDX. You know, you go to DYDX exchange, dot exchange or whatever site, whatever domain it's hosted on. And then you click deposit and it just gives you an address and you send funds. And then like magically, like the funds show up in DYDX. Um, a couple minutes later, which is similar to the experience you have on a centralized exchange. 
but what's going on behind the scenes is all of this kind of magic um, where it's like you use the bridge and then you mint native USDC and then you transfer it via IBC um, to the DYDX chain. But all of this can happen through code rather than user steps that you might have to do. Um, so we're really putting a lot of work again behind the scenes to go into the product experience. And I think, you know, we really just try, are trying to build a more professional product, right? Um, I think the state of DeFi, maybe just zooming out a little bit right now, is still pretty early and fairly primitive in some ways. Like, it's just clearly a bad product experience to ship your users off to like, okay, first of all, like go off into some other bridging site and then like manage to bridge your funds to our chain. And then like, second of all, I hope you come back, like fingers crossed, and like actually use the, the funds on the other side. Like that's terrible. Um, it's not to say bridges are bad, right? It's more just like the clients themselves um, should support being able to, to use them behind the scenes and users really shouldn't even have to know what's going on in, in such a big way. So it's really not going to be so much of a product experience that I think users are used to in DeFi. Like I think the users that are using DeFi now do you kind of understand this, right? You know, you could have USDC on Polygon or Ethereum or whatever else, and people sort of understand that. But if you're onboarding or trying to explain DeFi to your friend, you're like, oh man, like you can have USDC on this chain or that chain, and there's like all this different stuff going on. I think that's sort of a relic of the times and that that's clearly a pretty bad user experience and I don't think will exist so much long term. Um, but that's kind of a bet that we're taking with the on the product side with V4. And really the goal is to try to build something that feels like a centralized exchange in the ways that centralized exchanges are good, right? But still has a lot of the advantages of a decentralized exchange in the ease of onboarding, in the transparency and security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's hard to build. Like there's a ton of stuff behind the scenes. It's like, oh, now we got to go integrate with all these different bridges and we got to do all the IBC transactions for you and all this other stuff. But I think that really is what's required to build a great product experience and thinking about the user journey from from end to end and that's what we're trying to do yeah absolutely that sounds incredible i'm like extremely excited to to check it out whenever uh, you guys launch the v4 chain but i guess my last question because you've already been so generous with your time and then dan i'll pass it back over to you if you have anything else but um you've seen a lot of success with gmx's token model and like you know returning some of the platform fees back to token stakers or lps is that something i believe i saw you tweet at one point that's something you're considering but uh i'm curious to get your thoughts on that and and you know maybe how much how much value would be passed back to uh, token stakers or LPs in that scenario? So first of all, it's really not something that's up to me. So regardless of what I want, it's kind of up to the community at this point. Um, not even kind of like it's absolutely up to them. Um, I can express my views on what maybe should happen for, for DYDX and DeFi long term, but it's really not up to me. Um, that being said, I, I think there does exist the requirements for a layer one token call it on the DYDX chain. Um, and just economically, that layer one chain needs to be used for staking right to validators. Um, and the main way validators are going to be operating and be incentivized is through the trading fees on the platform. Um, so potentially, you know, those could potentially go to whatever the layer one token is um, split between the validators and the stakers as well. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense long term, but yeah, in general, I think it's more up to the community as to what happens with the DYDX token long term. Yeah, I definitely think that makes a ton of sense. And just given that, you know, when you move off of a general purpose chain uh, like Ethereum, where you have more of a, a governance token, you know, then you move into this uh, proof of stakes model where your your base asset or your uh, layer one token really does need to uh, kind of help secure the chain. Um, and so you. It, there's definitely different trade-offs uh, and a different design space when thinking about how to like build out a, a monetary premium for that asset. Um, do you think it's like almost more complicated, uh, or just like I guess maybe maybe that's not the right word, but just like a different uh, thought process that you need to roll through because uh, there already is a DYDX token, uh, and then like you're kind of like backing into the the L1 chain itself. I think it's slightly different, and it's really not just the token. I think it's a much bigger deal actually that DYDX exists as a platform and like literally an exchange you can trade on on a different platform like on layer two on ethereum and not only does it exist but it has quite a good amount of traction so far right like we have around a billion dollars a day being traded and that's some pretty real activity um i think there's positives and negatives to that i think it's you know going back to brands gives us a much better brand 
um, as a protocol to be able to go out and launch our own chain successfully, right? Um, probably like validators are already going to be pretty excited about uh, the DYDX chain. Whereas if we were just some random new project launching from zero to one, it may be a lot harder for the protocol to go out and find validators to support it. Um, but at the same time, it makes it harder as well um, because just the level of execution from a product perspective, the level of security that users demand because absolutely there is a lot of TVL on the platform and a lot of notional value that's being traded in the contracts is pretty high and we take that pretty seriously. Um, so I think that requires us as the developers to do a lot of internal audits, adhere to really high testing standards. Um, but luckily we have a lot of experience doing that as a development team. I think the biggest thing we have going for us at DYDX is that at least I really think that we have the best, if not one of the best development teams um, for anyone in DeFi. And I think that just gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of what we want to build long term. We build a lot of stuff, right? We've built layer one contracts for margin trading, for lending, for derivatives trading. We are the leading DApp on uh, layer two right now. Fast forward to what we're building now, building our own Cosmos SDK chain and Go. Um, and I think just that level of flexibility and the experience building all these things along the way goes a long way in terms of just having really good standards for development. And I think that is really something that's really, really critical. And actually, I think people realize it's important, but still underrate it in terms of like how important it is for a DeFi platform. Um, because I think that's where all of the security comes from. And there is a lot of this stuff. You know, we've talked about the indexer. Um, we've talked about the, the bridging behind the scenes. And there are a number of other things like that that really goes on in the background, but that are required to make a really great product experience. So I think there's positives and negatives to it. But overall, I think it's mostly a positive. Awesome. Well, you know, Antonio, we really thank you for taking some time and coming on and just kind of talking about, you know, the uh, broader market conditions and, you know, ultimately what that means for DYDX and what's also to come. Uh, you know, you, you're an OG builder in the space, along with your team, you've been pushing forward this great protocol. Uh, and so really excited to see uh, as you continue to push the bounds of what's possible with the Cosmos uh, SDK chain. Uh, so thanks again for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me, guys, and I really appreciate the great questions. All right. That was a great chat with Antonio. He is always super insightful. I love listening to him myself on podcasts, so to have him on uh, and talk to him face-to-face -face was, was quite a treat. Um, in lieu of all the FTX Alameda drama, there's no doubt that people are taking self-custody a lot more seriously. Uh, and when they do that, they definitely want to be able to utilize their assets um, on a decentralized exchange. And especially if you want leverage, you know, DYDX is one of the primary venues to go and do that. So there's no doubt that they're uh, leading the charge on that front. But Dan, what would you think of the interview? Yeah, I, it was great to like hear his take on what the FTX situation means for the space in general. You know, he's been around since the very early days uh, building it on Ethereum. Um, so he's, he's got a lot of experience within like what we've been through uh, and what's to come. So loved his insights there. Uh, and he hit kind of hit the nail on the head, in my opinion, on, you know, how can we trust centralized exchanges uh, with, yeah, like we definitely need proof of reserves. That's a great first step. Uh, but it's almost like a mute point without uh, like a proof of solvency on the liability sides of things as well. Uh, and that's a little bit harder to solve. So uh, I think we almost have like a tech issue there and probably need some like improvements on uh, ZK tech and just zero knowledge uh, technology being deployed uh, even on that sense, right? So like you can hide the, uh, the actual holdings while still knowing that yes, indeed, uh, you are solvent. Um, I don't know, for me, like the more interesting side of the conversation, just because I'm uh, super excited about uh, like the technology, uh, the tech stack in the cosmos is like really the move uh, uh, from Ethereum to cosmos. Um, and yeah, I think my ultimate, my largest takeaway from the whole thing would be, you know, building in an app chain gives a couple different benefits and uh, one of them is really composability uh, or customization, I should say, and specifically the customization of the validator set. That's just something you can't do on a general purpose L1. Uh, and it really seems like they're pushing the envelope there. Uh, so we can dive in a, a bit deeper in different, different sex, uh, so, so we can dive in a dip, bit, wow. So we can dive in a bit deeper there on some different sections uh, and kind of go back and forth because I, I know we, uh, let's hit up like a little bearish and bullish take on these. Yeah, I would say I'm bearish like for a couple different reasons. I think, you know, the main argument for people who aren't just super big decentralization maxis 
of moving from uh, an app-specific StarkX application versus um, a Cosmos app-specific chain. I think people usually argue, yeah, you're paying rent to Ethereum in order to live there, but everyone wants to be their own landlord. But at the end of the day, I think running your own validator set and actually incentivizing it is a lot more expensive and difficult of a task to actually achieve. Um, so, you know, you got to pay DYDX tokens in order to incentivize uh, validators with DYDX at stake. So that would kind of be one of my rebuttals. And I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that one, Dan. Yeah, uh, I thought that was interesting as well, right? So they're paying more probably, but in return, they're getting uh, decentralization through uh, being able to customize the validator set to run this uh, validator memory order book. Uh, I think that's like the trade-off that they're looking for, right? And you know, that's, you know, he said trade-off, I can't even count how many times in that interview, right? And that's that's like you, the way that he's thinking about this is, yes, I gained something, but what am I giving up to get there? Uh, and to me, it seems like maybe they're giving up that like sense of community or that user base uh, in return for a decentralization. And, you know, he's a very product first guy and to him, decentralization is very high on the list of needs. Yeah, and then in, in terms of like the Cosmos ecosystem, like, you know, we had Sam and Yusuf on last week uh, talking about how Prop 82 failed. That's obviously kind of a dent in the Cosmos roadmap. And then we also don't see any chains with significant TVL since the Terra collapse in the Cosmos ecosystem. So while composability might be seen, seen as like kind of like a, a pro for their move into the Cosmos in, in relation to being a Stark X application, I feel like there really isn't that much to gain. How would you kind of rebuttal that comment? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like they are going to be the ones bringing value into the Cosmos, right? Um, I think the question is like, okay, well, how are users going to get there? And the bridging solutions definitely will need to be broken out. And I actually hadn't heard of this USDC bridge, uh, or this like native cross-chain communication uh, protocol that Circle is looking to build. Um, and after the conversation, I immediately dove in and started reading about this. Uh, and this actually seems like the perfect solution for something like DYDX to help get assets, you know, maybe from uh, Ethereum or even another L1 onto DYDX. Uh, but you're right, like they're going to be the ones bringing the, the heat first, I think. Uh, but there are more, there is building going on, right? Um, even though Prop 82 failed and Atom 2.0 is like going to be broken up into different pieces, um, there are still 10 consumer chains that are eager to use interchain security and the ecosystem is still going to get built out. Uh, it's just a question of how long will that take? Um, you know, I, I do, I do wonder, uh, that what the, the cause was really offer DYDX, but again, I think, um, DYDX will really be the ones bringing value to the cosmos. Yeah, I feel like maybe Antonio, we probably should have dug into this a little bit more um, in the interview, but he's he's done it so many times. But I think he's just honestly bullish on the idea of sovereign app specific chains over like a world computer Ethereum vision. Um, so that that must be, you know, the logic behind that one. But I'm curious too what you think about um, the DYDX token itself. We couldn't get much alpha out of Antonio on that front because ultimately it's going to be left up to the community. Um, but, you know, the token supply has been up only because they use it to pay out traders to incentivize them. Um, and they pay it out based on volume, I believe. And uh, I think you could also make an argument that that's why their volume has been so significantly high is through these DYDX token incentives. Um, but yeah, the token price has suffered as a result. So do you think maybe the move to Cosmos does provide more out, uh, outlets to you know provide value accrual to DYDX? The move to Cosmos kind of enables them to have a DYDX to potentially be this layer one base asset as opposed to a an application token, right? Um, and DYDX has been around for a while, and we've seen a lot of these OG Gen 1 protocols find their tokens a little less equipped to um, kind of be these revenue distribution methods or these uh, token incentiv incentivization tools. Uh, and while these newer protocols are kind of like working out ways to do that, you know, we've seen a lot of vote escrow plat protocols uh, make an attempt at doing this, some far more successful than others. Uh, we've seen a lot of like real yield narrative getting pushed through and about how uh, protocol revenues are being passed back to token holders. Uh, and that's kind of something that you can see would be working with a proof of stake chain, right? Um, and so it kind of opens up the door to like be able to pass revenue to the validators who are performing a service for your network. Uh, it's in a decentralized manner. It kind of gets them maybe uh, under the under the security uh, of of or under the hiding away from the security of regulation. Um, but yeah, I think there's just a lot of different ways you can go with this, uh, and 
it's good to see that they're like actually thinking about how are they going to you know use their token to to bring value or how are they going to use the protocol to bring value back to their token yeah what was it they said a hundred million dollars a day of trading volume even if there is you know 0.1 percent fees what would that be like a hundred thousand dollars a day to token stakers so i mean that that could go really really well if that's the the option they opt for um but yeah i think most definitely it definitely gives their token more utility um, they have more sovereignty over like what they can do and then they can get their community more involved in governance and truly make a really great self-sustaining decentralized product so that's definitely something i'm looking forward to but uh the one thing that does worry me is the mev landscape i don't really know how that's going to look do you do you have any thoughts on the the things that antonio said on the mev thought process there yeah i think the takeaway there is it's just a problem that we're everybody's working on how to solve right um, I do like their approach because in with a uh, application specific blockchain, the validators are inherently uh, economically incentivized to work in the best interest of the protocol. And that's definitely not necessarily true on something like a general purpose uh, uh, layer one like Ethereum, right? The validators have their own sets of interests that maybe are totally irrelevant uh, to your protocol. Uh, whereas on an application specific blockchain, they're their future revenue that directly depends on the success of the chain. Uh, so doing something that would maybe adversely affect the users of the protocol uh, and therefore discouraging them to continue using the protocol would actually hurt the validators. So there's a little bit of a different dynamic, um, but I, I do think this is really an unsolved problem. Now, seeing how they're kind of like pushing the um, validator design space forward and like really working on uh, how like pushing that forward in the sense that uh, they're, they're working to build new things and not just like copy pasting existing projects. I, I do think that we're going to see a lot of innovation on the MEV landscape from this team as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a project that I'm uh, really excited about and I'm going to be watching closely. I think it's kind of the, the final like thing that everyone's watching to see if the app specific thesis is the one to go with or if Ethereum really will be the glo global settlement layer for, for, for roll ups. So Definitely watching it closely, and uh, we'll see you guys back here next week on Zero X Research. Thanks for tuning in.